from Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hi, my name is Karan. Uh, I'm also Flores Reinvention, and you're listening to the Bola Bola Show. Hello, listener, and Happy New Year 2022. It's me, Elvin, and it's the first episode of the Bola Bola Show this year. So together with me today is Sivan. Hey, buddy, how's it been? Happy New Year, everyone. How's it going, Elvin? I mean, everything is perfectly pretty normal. Things are opening up and, you know, it's a brand new year. Let's kick it off with the brand new show. And we have an interesting topic today to discuss. Uh, yeah, it's a, new, it's a new book by, exactly, none, Sivan. Other, by yep. none other than a former guest of our show, you may have heard him from our previous episode, which I will leave the link in the description. He wrote the book, I mean, basically about Red Bull's involvement in football. So we are glad to have again, Karan Tejwani, all the way from Preston, UK. Welcome to the Bola Bola Show, my friend. Welcome, thank Karan. You, Karan. Yeah, thank you, Alvin, as well. Uh, thank you for having me on. It's good to be back. Okay, all right. So, Karan, I mean, uh, firstly, you know, let's talk about what you've been up to these days. Besides, of course, besides promoting your new book, which is about to come out soon, uh, any other interesting projects that you're undertaking at the moment? Um, I've just been uh, going on with life. Just uh, uh, I've been at university for most of this time. Uh, I'm in my final year at university, so just finishing off with that. Got my last few months, um, so just looking forward to the end. And um, apart from that, just doing some regular stuff for websites here and there. Uh, I've been following up a few stories. Recently worked on a piece about Valencia and uh, just, just regular football stuff that the life of a journalist is how it is. It's just you, you try to keep up with stories around football and, and try to focus on that. So no major projects yet, but it's just regular journalism work. Mm-hmm. You mentioned something about Valencia. And as you know, the owner, Peter Lim, is from this part of the world, so Singaporean. Is there anything that you would like to share with us? Yeah, he's just not very popular in Valencia. I'm not sure that's what you, what you want to hear, but uh, he's not very popular in Valencia. He's, uh, the, the fans want him out. They've had enough of him. He's just been um, sort of dragging the club through a pretty bad phase. Uh, they aren't winning things. As, they aren't as traditionally Valencia field is supposed to be as big as or this, the third biggest club behind Barcelona and Real Madrid, but that just hasn't been the case for the last few years, mm-hmm. despite some promising signs. So it's just not going very well for Peter Lim. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's gone in a couple of months. Yep, interesting in interesting indeed. And uh, you know, is is there going to be a Valencia project for you in terms of a book, maybe? Um, not that I've planned right okay. now, no, but maybe All right. something. If it's if it interests me in the near future, then sure, I'll look into it. But not right, right now, no. All right, great. And uh, you know, current your the current book now that is titled "The Glorious Reinvention." You know, the rebirth of Ajax Amsterdam. So you know, what was the main inspiration for you to write this book? Um, the main inspiration was that Ajax itself are such a historic club uh, and you know one of the more uh, respected clubs in football. I, I personally, I, I love what Ajax do and what, have they, what they've done for so many, so many years. Um, you know, the, the 2019, 2018-19 season in the Champions League, I think most people who've started watching football in the last decade or so would identify with that Ajax team when they reached the semi-final. I think the most popular game was when they beat Real Madrid 4-1. Uh, that personally is my favorite game of all time, my favorite club game of all time. And um, that was the main inspiration behind it. Uh, when you look at Ajax as a whole, I think if, off the top of a football fan's head, uh, you look at Ajax in the 70s as Cruyff, uh, Michels, um, the Champions League wins, uh, Stefan Kovacs. In the 80s, uh, you move to Cruyff becoming a manager and great players coming through like uh, Van Basten and all that. In the 90s, is Louis van Gaal, uh, Van der Zaar, etc., but there's a gap in the 2000s where there isn't much identity for Ajax and they became a bit of a, a, a club in a slump. Mm-hmm. And then you move to 2010 and there's a Europa League final, the Champions League semi-final. So the book basically focuses on that little slump they had and how they rose. So basically covering Ajax in the 21st century. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, you know, as you mentioned, you know, the main catalyst that led to Ajax resurgence in recent time is that Europa League semi-final in uh, Europa League final in 2017, and that semi-final in the UEFA Champions League. You know, basically, Ajax were just minutes away from playing in a, in a Champions League final. But what was the reason behind that resurgence? If you can share. 
it, it comes as a lot of factors. I think the main factor would be that uh, they raised their transfer cap and their wage budget uh, to attract better players. Uh, now, obviously, if you know for, if, if if you know how football works, it's just very simple. The more the more money you spend, the more likely you are to win things. And for a period, Ajax were refusing to spend or overspend money on players. And when they were spending, it wasn't very good because it wasn't very informed. It wasn't very effective spending. So they wasted money on big on big players. Uh, a, a big example would be Miralem Soleimani in 2011 and uh, in 2010, sorry. And they all failed to deliver. Um, so so issues like that was were holding Ajax back. And, um, you know, that sort of thing. They wanted to avoid mistakes of old, promote from within. And also when they were buying players, they wanted to buy players who were effective to the side. Uh, I'd say Hakim Ziyech in 2016 was uh, the turning point. They signed him quite late in the window, but they spent 11 million euros on him and they and they brought him in. And he was sort of the catalyst for that the new transfer policy. In 2018, that policy was altered again and they were able to sign bigger players like Tarlet and, and Daley Blint. And those all three of those players were quite effective for Ajax. And obviously, Tarlet and Blint play there right now. Uh, so I'd say that the transfer policy was one of the bigger reasons for it. Uh, one of the other big reasons would be the revamping of the academy. Uh, obviously, in recent times, we've seen Ajax bring players like Delex, De Jong, Van de Beek uh, come through the academy and become first team players. So in the last few years, they've they've revamped the academy to produce better quality footballers and and footballers who can play not just at a, at a DBC level, but at a Champions League level as well. So those two factors were a big change. Um, other than that, you could look at improvements in the coaches they brought in. Peter Bosch and Eric Ten Hag were both great coaches for them. And, you know, the club's been reinvented, as, as the book's name suggests. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, was, was there an issue with the academy during this, uh, this gap season? I mean, this gap period, I would say. Because Ajax was always known as a very academy club, right? Churning out very good young talent and all that. So, what's, what, like, like what, what happened during that period? There was a big gap. There was a big um, stain on on what the academy was producing. This is what uh, this is what the turning point was. Johan Cruyff in 2010 said that uh, the academy wasn't performing to the level it was used to. So obviously, the Wild Revolution happened in 2010 when Johan Cruyff said he wants to help the club become better again or become good again. And his main uh, one of his main uh, points was that the academy wasn't performing up to a required standard, and that was because the coaches at the academy weren't good enough. So when he made his changes, a lot of the academy staff were fired or they were moved on to smaller roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the players were given a set standard to play at. So these players were mainly being told to win games at a youth level, which Johan Cruyff felt was not important. He wanted the young players to learn how to play football and play uh, beautiful football and, and that sort of thing, the Ajax way. Um so at that point, between 2000 and 2010, Ajax weren't able to produce those players required. And the players that came through the academy weren't able to play at a first team level because they were so poorly trained uh, in the academy. So um, that, that was what changed for them at, the, at an academy standpoint. And even in, in the late 90s, the introduction of the Bossman rule where uh, these players could move on at the end of their contracts. So Ajax weren't really... Uh, giving players long-term contracts and they were losing good players for free and losing them early on in their careers. So that was one of the main issues they had to face. So, uh, yeah, it, it required a big revamp from the academy. And now, obviously, we see so many players coming through. Ryan Gravenbush and Urien Timber are in the team right now. And even before, we had Delic De Jong and uh, Van Der Beek and Onana. Obviously, De Jong is an academy player, but a lot of those similar players, the younger players are bought from other clubs. Mm-hmm. And you know, as 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 mentioned, you know, AX, you know, such a, a club with such a long history, you know. So how Im- important is this revival, you know, when putting into context 20, the twenty first century football? It's very important. I think that football needs a good Ajax um, mm-hmm. in the state of football, where the top five leagues dominate um, the the game. You know, but it just it just becomes quite dull and tedious and boring because. We just see clubs from England, Spain, Germany, Italy, France, mainly England right now, uh, winning things. So it's just not very enjoyable. So the, 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 top, the non-top five leagues have sort of been put behind. And we have seen historic clubs from across Europe struggling to face these top clubs. You know, yeah. Now, it's, it's yeah. good that in the Champions League this season, we have clubs like Ajax and Sporting uh, in the round of 16 and, and even Benfica. So it, it's good for football. And, and Ajax 
in, in terms of their history itself, they deserve to be where they are right now. They should always be a top 10, top 15 club in Europe playing in the knockout stage of the Champions League every season. And a lot of it was not their fault that they were struggling. You know, they, the financial side of things was favouring the top five leagues and they were left behind. So it's good that Ajax have been promoting from within and, and sort of working themselves up to, towards playing at that level. Mm-hmm. Okay. And of course, with every success that Ajax achieve, you know, it comes at a price of losing their best talent to far richer clubs in Europe. You have mentioned the top five uh, European leagues. So what has been that key factor in keeping the club going despite having to sell its best players? It's part of the philosophy at Ajax that they will lose players when they become, uh, when, when they play at a higher level. And they were prepared for the departures of Frankie de Jong and, and Matthijs Lix in 2019. It's always part of their plan that they will lose these players in time. Um, they try their best to keep them as, as long as possible, but because the Dutch league isn't as attractive to certain players as, as say, the La Liga or, um, or the Premier League, it's just, it just not a very sustainable thing that like, we expect them to stay there for careers. Um, so it, it's part of their model. And, and when they sell these players, they want to make enough money so that they can fund the next generation. So whatever they make, they fund into the academy or fund a replacement that can... Uh, play at a similar level, you know. In 2019, when when Delic, uh, Frankie De Jong was sold in January, and Delic was almost definitely going to go in the summer, they had already signed their replacements before they left, um, or almost at the time they left. So they knew what they were signing up for, and, and it's part of their plan. Um, so they they try to encourage these players to stay as long as they can. Uh, in 2019, once again, I'm going to bring up the example. Uh, there were seven players in the Ajax squad that were expected to become big players in the future. That includes De Ligt, De Jong, Kluivert, Onana, uh, Kasper Dahlberg, and, and a couple of others. And they specifically designed packages for them to say that this is the plan for you and we want you to perform at this level. Uh, if you stay at this club for two, three more years, you can achieve this. And all of those players stayed except for Justin Kluivert. And all those players went on to bigger things while Justin Kluivert is sort of becoming an afterthought in, in, this, in this context. Um, so they, they try their best to keep players and make specific plans for them. And when they go, they're happy to see them go because there's an agreement between them. They won't hold them back. And, you know, it's a, it's a respectful way of going about their business. And it's not very toxic as we see in other clubs where players hand and transfer requests or it becomes a big issue with the media and all that. So there's, there's a plan for everything. As one star, one big star of the team is ready to go. There's always one star in the making. Mm. So, so, so in a way, there's always like this exit plan for the player up front. The, the guy already knows what, what he's getting himself into, right? Yeah, yeah, there, there, is, there is. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's sort of, you know, we know what we're doing and we will help you to achieve that goal. Mm-hmm. Okay, very interesting. And, you know, if you look at the current AX uh, staff, you know, the coaching and the management, you know, it consists of so many former players, you know, Wendersa as the general director, you know, you have Overmars as a director of football, to name a few, Michael Reisiger is there, Winston Bogart, Richard Weisscheck, and also, of course, uh, Danny Blind as well on the board. So, you know, is, is this some sort of tradition that goes on in AX, you know, by inviting all these former players to take important roles in the club? Uh, it was part of their plan. It was part of Johan Cruyff's plan that um, when Ajax, uh, at the peak of the revolution uh, back in 2010, it was part of Johan Cruyff's plan that he wants former players to be a part of the club and not just in a coaching capacity. So uh, when his revolution started, uh, Martin Yol was the manager. He was sacked and he was replaced by um, Frank de Boer. And he obviously went on to win four league titles. Uh, uh, and he had a staff that included Dennis Bergkamp and a few other Ajax players, uh, former Ajax players. Um, so it, it's part of their plan to have these ex-players and ex-coaches in high positions at Ajax because they know what it's like to play for Ajax, firstly. And secondly, they know what it's like to have a connection with the Ajax fans. Um, so Kreifeld maintained that sort of romanticism was important in helping the club go forward. And it, it's been it's proven to be a popular strategy at other clubs as well. I think Barcelona have been... Uh, quite consistent with that model as well in recent times. Uh, Bayern Munich have been known to do that as well. Obviously, the president now is Oliver Kahn and, and this big uh, involvement by ex-players. So a lot of a lot of top European clubs do and Ajax felt it was important to do as well because there's this connection that these former players had. And it's proven to be quite successful. So there's no, there's been no reason to change it as well. Uh, obviously, Van der Sar has been, was, was the Champions League winning goalkeeper and now he's the club CEO and he's Commercially, they've been quite successful, even when other clubs have been uh, have been struggling during COVID because games have been behind closed doors. 
Ajax made a loss, but their loss was a financial loss, but their financial loss was still smaller than uh, most other top European clubs. When you look at the state of Barcelona or even uh, Real Madrid or other clubs, Ajax is still quite financially healthy compared to these clubs. And he's been at the club for the last eight years, Van der Zell, and he's been quite successful in terms of marketing and, and commercial activities. Mark Overmarsh is the director of football, and in terms of the transfers, we've seen how successful they are, whether they're bringing in players or selling players. So these 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 people have been quite successful, and even on the current stuff, Eric Den Haag isn't a former Ajax player. He has no connection with Ajax. He's from from Twenty, so um, he's been in there and he's been helped by ex Ajax players like Bograd. So um, you know, having these these ex players help foreigners or or foreign Ajax or people who don't have any connection with Ajax come in and understand what it's like to be at Ajax. So it's been quite helpful for them. Mm. And and it's really nothing like having footballers in really good football positions up in management, you know, like director of football and all that, you know, rather than having some yeah. market, some marketing guys or somebody trying to fit into their role. Yeah, that's, that's, it, that's what it helps create a connection as well for the fans. Yeah. You know, fans don't traditionally think about the commercial director or yeah. they don't think about who's in the yeah. marketing team. Yeah. But if there's an next player, there's a great connection to it and you feel more happy to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like this particular model, can, is it, can it be replicated in other clubs? Or it, it, it's, it's something that goes even deeper than that of having former players taking up important position within the club? I think it, you can have it at other clubs, but you need to have the right experience and the right people in there. Uh, you know, Manchester United tried to do it with uh, Ali Gunnar Solskjaer and for a period it worked well but it wasn't very sustainable in the very long term because there were great complications above Solskjaer you know when you think about the Glazers or, the, or Ed Woodward it just wasn't very uh-huh. comfortable for Solskjaer he wasn't given much, as much freedom uh, even Chelsea had to with Frank Lampard didn't work out well and the next season they won the Champions League so it, 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 it's, it, you need to have the right amount of experience to do it Van Zell went after retiring Van Zell went to university to study football business and that part that was part of his experience, and he had two years as a director of marketing at Ajax before being given the CEO role. So he built up that experience and education to become uh, uh, good at his job. Even Mark Overmarsh, before becoming the football director at Ajax, he was the director of football at Goat Eagles. So he had success there. He put the club up to from the second division to the first division. He built up that experience, and now he's doing well at Ajax. So you need to build up that experience and then build up. Uh, yeah, you need to be given some time and freedom to make your mistakes. And both Van Der Zaar and Overmarsh made their mistakes before coming to this point where they're successful right now. So you need to be given time and space and, and more freedom. So other clubs can do it. It's just, mm. it's just varying around different factors. Okay, okay. Now let's talk about Eric, Eric Ten Hag. I mean, obviously he's one of the highly related coaches right now in Europe and is sought after by big clubs, especially in Manchester United because he was heavily linked to replace Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. What can you tell us more about him in terms of his coaching style and his football philosophy? I'd say Eric Ten Hag is one of the most unique coaches or one of the more unique coaches in European football. And, you know, we've seen that in the last few years, in, in, in his four years at Ajax, he's reached the Champions League knockout stages twice. He's won the LADBC title twice. He's won the Cup twice. And he would have won more if it wasn't for COVID because COVID stopped him uh, from winning three in a row. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's done quite well in his time. And, uh, every player that's played under him has has only had good things to say about him. I spoke to a couple of players, his former players at uh, Go Ahead Eagles and, and Bayern Munich, that, and they say he's very meticulous, he's very well thought, he plans for the long run and also focuses heavily on the game and he's, he keeps his feet on the ground even after winning big games. You know, there's, there's this story after he beat Real Madrid 4-1 uh, in 2019 that when they were on the plane back home from, from Madrid to Amsterdam, everyone was in a different area, celebrating while Ten Hag was planning for the next league game. Um, so, you know, that's just how he is. He keeps his feet on the ground and focuses on the task in hand. Um, but, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a brilliant man manager, I would say. Um, a lot of his work revolves around psychology and understanding the psychology of footballers and understanding his people. Uh, but, but that's how he is. I think that in time, he will be managing one of the biggest clubs or one of the bigger clubs in Europe, whether that's Manchester United or Barcelona or whatever. Um, but he does have a big future in the game for sure. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, current. Um, let's talk a bit about your book now, right? So, uh, you know, what what can the reader expect when they get into your book? Uh, the book is mainly focusing on Ajax and uh, in the twenty first century, as I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Uh, the first part of the book, it, it's basically split into three parts. The first part of the book okay. is about Ajax and the history. It's a small portion about the history, you know, uh, looking at them from like when they were stopped, when they were founded until uh, the 1990s. Then it looks at uh, the 1990s to the 2010 period until the Velvet Revolution happened with Johan Cruyff. Mm-hmm. So that looks at the Champions League win under Louis van Gaal. It looks at uh, the introduction of the Bosman rule and their move to the Amsterdam Arena, both of which were big events for Ajax in the 90s. And then it focuses on their period of struggle where they were having conflicts within the club, having financial losses, having struggles. They, they were failing to win trophies. And then it focuses on the revolution itself, which was quite, uh, it was a lot of betrayal, a lot of backstabbing, lots of infighting. Uh, and it was ultimately settled and won by Johan Cruyff's uh, camp and his, and his group of a group of former players that were interested in improving Ajax. The second part of the book looks at the 2010s, which is basically Frank de Boer's title wins, uh, Peter Bosch's Europa League final team and the Champions League semi-final team. So it looks at the more successful side, the more glowing side, mm-hmm. uh, whilst also focusing on the background of the club. So, you know, there was a bit of trouble when Johan Cruyff left in 2015 and it focused on that. And the third part of the book looks at how they became so successful again. So it focuses on their transfer policy, the academy, and the introduction of the new women's team in 2012. Uh, so it, it covers three different parts of three different eras. Mm-hmm. Okay, fantastic. And and Karen, you know, this this now being your second book, you know, so what sort of advice can you give all those budding writers out there? Uh, next advice I would uh, advice I would give is just basically keep writing. I think that um, mm-hmm. you know it, it comes to you naturally that you want to work on a project as big as a book because it, it, writing a book it takes up a lot of time from your life. Uh, this particular book took almost one year for me. It just takes it, it's basically the last thing you think of when you go to sleep or and the first thing you think of in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know it, it takes up a huge amount of time, but it's it's a brilliant process if you're fully into it. And once you get into it. Uh, so the advice I would give is to keep writing and keep reading more into what you're doing because it just builds up the love for you. Mm, nice, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, fantastic. And I just want to go back to the Ajax team. I mean, if I look at the squad, you know, it's a very cosmopolitan team. So is, is uh, does Ajax have some sort of a scouting network that runs throughout the world in identifying young talents from everywhere? They do have a big scouting network uh, and it's mainly focused around uh, European nations and South American nations. Uh, the European nations they look at is obviously the Netherlands, and alongside them it's Belgium and France. Uh, and they used to and they used to be more focused on the Scandinavian region, so mainly around Denmark and sometimes Sweden. Uh, but that they've reduced that a bit in recent years and focused more on South America. Now, previously they felt South America was a difficult region to scout in because of the third party ownership rules. Uh, but they've they, they've reversed that since about 2016, and they've hired more scouts uh, to focus on that area. Uh, namely Hank Wellmate, who discovered Luis Suarez for Groningen in 2005. Um, so once they did that, they were focused more on South America and they've obviously bought great players from that area. If you look at Argentina, there's Nicolas Taliafico who's come in and he's been very good for Ajax in the last five, six years. Uh, David Neres, uh, Anthony, who's there now. Uh, you know, basically certain players who were part of the Champions League winning teams and certain players who are part of the team now. You know, Anthony this season has been one of Europe's brightest players. Uh, so yeah. it, they, they've been focusing more on South America in recent times and it's proven to be quite profitable for them as well. Mm-hmm. And of course, Lisandro Martinez has another quality. Lisandro percentage. Martinez as well. Yeah. Martinez and Edson Alvarez from Mexico as well. I forgot those two. But yeah, those two have become mainstays in the team as well, just providing with versatility and all that. So it, it's been quite successful. Okay. All right. Mm, okay. Okay, Elvin, any last questions from yourself? Yeah, sure. Just, just Karen, uh, can you let our listeners know when will the book be released and uh, how can they get a hold of it? Yeah, the book will be released on the 21st of March, 2022. So about two and a half months away. And you can get it on all major retailers on pre-order. So that can be Amazon or Book Depository. Or if you're in England, you can get through Waterstones. Uh, Basically all major retailers. Mm, Okay, Okay. nice, nice, nice. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. So Karen, any last words from yourself? Uh, no, that's just it's good to be on the podcast again. It was enjoyable last time. It's enjoyable this time as well. It's always good to talk about Ajax. Mm-hmm. And, 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 by the way, maybe you can share with us. I mean, what was the response like from your first book on Red Bull? Uh, it was mostly positive. Uh, I felt that it, it, because it was my first book, there was obviously a bit of nervousness around it. You know, would people like it or would people be interested? And I think a, a lot of people were quite interested in 
the topic itself, which I found quite surprising. I didn't think it would be that positive and that interesting to people, but it was. And and a lot of people, a lot of especially coaches, said to me that they were interested to learn more about the Red Bull way. And it, it was very rewarding to see that people were interested in in, in that way. Uh, you know, when when people go like, or sometimes people get send a tweet out to me or or message me saying I got this book for Christmas or I got this book for uh, my birthday or my anniversary gift. It, it's quite rewarding to hear. Um, so I think that's one of the more fun parts of writing a book when people give your books away as gifts. It's, it's just very humbling in a way. And I was quite happy to see that people were interested in the topic and it was received so well around the world. Mm, wonderful. And I'm sure this book will will have a similar response, in my opinion, because I mean, you're, you're, you're a very amazing football writer in your own right. So I'm sure people will enjoy this topic, definitely. Yeah, so, so you, you heard that, listeners. So start building up the line to get the book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's very kind yeah. of you. Obviously, it's very, it's very nice to have that around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. and we really, uh, you know, thank thank you, Karen, for joining us on board, and you know, really wish you all the best in this new book. Now, yeah, yeah. thank you so much, guys. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Then uh, also from me, thank you so much, Karen, for being our, our guest in the podcast, and we look forward to your book indeed as well. No problem. Happy to be on. Guys. Thank you so much. All right. So that folks, uh, that will brings us to the end of this episode of the Bola Bola Show podcast. So goodbye for now and thank you for listening.